right. So, um, hello, everyone. Um, I hope you're all having a good day, good evening, uh, wherever you are. I'm aware people have joined from all over the world. So, um, welcome to this um, uh, fascinating event. Uh, I thank you for also taking the time during what has been a trying period uh, for the entire world to participate in this webinar. Um, <clears throat> thoughtfully put together by Academy Kaba. Uh, my heart and prayers actually go out to those who have been I'm hoping and praying that, you know, in the middle of this adversity, that you're surrounded by, you know, the warm embrace of your, of your loved ones. I also want to thank Chris, uh, Daba founder, for this fantastic opportunity to shine a ray of hope amid, you know, what has been a dark storm uh, for, for many. And to share my thoughts on how we can lead through this crisis, uh, particularly uh, from a self-leadership uh, standpoint. I, I, I love the words of, uh, of um, Aldous Huxley. She said, you see, actually all, all good or bad leadership uh, in families and in the worlds of business, in politics, in governance, all good or bad leadership in these areas begin with good or bad self-leadership. Um, if leadership is influence, then what you do personally will have a direct impact on the people within your sphere of influence who look up to you uh, for direction. What this means basically is that we all our leaders, even if we do not currently occupy leadership positions, and whether we acknowledge the fact or not, in one way or another, we have people who look up to us for leadership in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, uh, even online on social media. Uh, so what we do personally and how we approach this crisis can have a significant impact on these people who look up to us. It could be your spouse, it could be your kids, it could be your siblings, it could be your colleagues at work, it could even be your neighbors. Whatever you do personally and how you approach this crisis will have a significant impact on these people, um, which basically makes crisis times the best times to know the stuff that leaders are made of. Mind you, every time uh, I mention the word leader, I want you to put your name in there. So crisis times are the best times to know what, uh, to know the stuff, I beg your pardon, that leaders are made of. Um, crisis reveals us to ourselves and to the world. Crisis reveals us to ourselves and to the world. Uh, do you know why when you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice and not apple juice? It's because the pressure you apply only forces out what's already inside the orange. And that's what Chris was just talking about uh, before we started. That some people have been wondering why certain people, have, uh, certain people have been composed, you know, they've been calm, cool, calm, and collected in the midst of all the craziness going on in the world. Actually, the crisis is only revealing what they've always been. So crisis really, come to reveal who we've always been, um, which is why the best time to prepare for a crisis, it's certainly not in the middle of one. The best time to prepare for a crisis is not in the middle of one. You don't prepare for an examination in the examination hall. You don't rehearse a theatrical performance on the day of the show in front of the paying audience. You don't do that. Uh, there's an old Spartan saying that says, if you sweat more in training, you will bleed less in war. Mm. If you sweat more in training, you're going to bleed less in war. Um, so really, the best time to prepare for war is in peacetime. And as you can see, we're actually in a war situation right now. I mean, in, almost, in very many European countries, in Nigeria, I understand, 
we have soldiers all across or on the streets um, trying to curtail movement. So it's basically a war situation. It's just that the world has a common enemy, uh, which is the coronavirus. So please get me. I'm not trying to minimize the impact of this crisis. I understand, you know, and I'm touched by this. My heart goes out to people, millions who have lost their jobs through no, no fault of theirs. Uh, what's worse is that millions have been inf infected. I was seeing on the news yesterday that one million confirmed infections globally. Um, and even more have lost uh, loved ones. And this pandemic has put paid to some of the best lead plans out there by organizations, by governments, you know, by corporations, by individuals. Many best lead plans have put paid to. So, I mean, look at the Olympics, crying out loud, got postponed. I, I can't remember, I can't recall ever reading that that ever happened since the inception of the Olympics. It got postponed. Many you know, money spinning sporting competitions and events were discontinued, like the English Premier League. You know, so this thing caught the world off guard. Mm. Uh, but do you know what is also true? There are people who have lost their jobs, as we speak right now, who are not down and out or needing to start a GoFundMe campaign because they lost their jobs. I don't know if you get what I mean. There are people who have lost their jobs as we speak, but they are not going to start a GoFundMe campaign because they lost their jobs. Do you know why? Because they had a saving culture prior to now, which means that they had always lived within their means and they had, they had already set aside an emergency fund that they can fall back on until this thing, you know, this pandemic ties over. And, you know, this is even more critical for individuals who live in countries with limited or no government assistance to mitigate the impact of the job loss. Uh, but, but the good news is that right now, as we speak, right now, as we speak, it doesn't matter what you've done before now, but right now, as we speak, is the next best time to arm yourself so you don't get drowned in whatever is happening around us. Only that, of course, it will be more challenging. There's no denying the facts. It will be more challenging for people who weren't prepared before now. Um, I mean, you, you can't go back into the past to change it. But there, there are things within your control that you can do right now to create a more desirable future uh, for yourself and your family. So I'm, I'm just going to share um, a few thoughts uh, with us and then bring this whole thing to a close. So my first point uh, that I would like to make is that prices aren't meant to break us. They are meant to build us. Prices aren't meant to break us. They are meant to build us. It's really a, a matter of perspective and mindset. Uh, look at what Emerson said. Emerson said, to different minds, you know, under the same horizon, to different minds, the same world, the same world in which they live is either a hell or a heaven. To different minds, the same world is either a hell or a heaven. Uh, which is why, given the exact same set of circumstances that we all are faced with today, some people will thrive and come out better and stronger on the other side of this pandemic, while others will crumble like a pack of cards, never to rise again. It's all about mastering one's own emotions, mastering your mind to see the opportunity in the adversity and to find ways, I mean, find ways deliberately, intentionally, to turn these present trying times into future trials. Look at what Mel Robbins said. Uh, she's the author of um, Stop Saying You're Fine. She says, the same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the, the egg. It's about what you're made of, not the circumstance. It's about what you're made of, not the circumstance. So, we definitely will not be able to reap the potential benefits in this crisis uh, if our eyes are shot by despair, uh, which is why one way to lead yourself through this crisis, because I'm focusing basically on self-leadership, which influences other forms of leadership. One way to lead yourself through this crisis, get your perspective on the matter right by realizing that crises aren't meant to break us. 
they're meant to build us. It takes me to my next point, which is very critical. My next point is surround yourself with positivity and shut out all negativity. Basically, feed your faith and starve your fears. Don't feed that monster called fear. Don't feed it. The only way you can do that is to drown yourself. I mean, just have the metaphor of a drowning man in your, in your mind. Drown yourself in positivity. This is not the time to camp on CNN or Fox News or wherever it is that you get your news updates from. Um, I mean, you should. I mean, you should stay informed. I'm not saying you shouldn't stay informed on what's going on around the globe, but you should also monitor the uh, and weigh, you know, the collateral impact of the news you're consuming on your mental health. Your mindset, I'm telling you, your mindset may just be your biggest asset in this crisis, and you want to protect that ferociously. If you step into my home office where I'm doing this uh, presentation from, um, while I'm working, I have podcasts and YouTube interviews with some of the brightest minds on the planet playing nonstop, you know, in the background. I'm either I'm watching London Real with Brian Rhodes and watching Impact Theory with uh, Tom Bilyeu. I'm listening to Valuetainment with Patrick and David. You can, you can capture the screen and check out these guys on YouTube. The content on there is amazing. It's something that is going to build your mind, build your faith, build your confidence, build your, your dreams, give you fresh ideas. So I'm, I'm just soaking in wisdom 247 from all these guys you know, on this slide. Constantly playing in the background. So there's no way I'm slipping into the hole of negativity in the middle of this thing. And there's no way I'm going to come out of this crisis the same way I went in. You know why? I'm coming out a better, much improved person, ready to take on the world in a way I have never done before. On my phone, as we speak, I'm always you know, receiving notifications. It's either I'm receiving notifications from my pastor, who, you know, who sends out blessings from the Bible through a daily newsletter. I'm receiving emails and newsletters from great thinkers, you know, like Robin Sharma, like Bob Proctor, Sam Adeyemi, Brendan Bouchard. So I'm, I'm soaked all around in positivity. Uh, I'm basically swimming, you know, in an ocean of positivity every day. And, and the impact on my mind and how I process events has been astounding. So you definitely want to do the same thing in a way that works for you. You don't have to follow my, my, you know, my model, but you can do the same things in a way that works for you, that fits your schedule. Because negativity is a luxury you cannot afford right now, trust me. Uh, I, I like what this uh, writer says. It says, ships don't sink because of the water around them, ships sink because of the water that gets in them. If you've seen movies of sinking ships, you have seen that the ships begin to sink once water starts to get into the ship. So don't let what's happening around you get inside you and weigh you down. Because once you allow that to happen, there's only one way you can go and that's down. You also surround yourself with positivity and shut out all negativity. So the first point, don't forget, prices are meant to build us, not break us. The second point, surround yourself with positivity and without all negativity. Now to my third point. I'm still talking about how to lead yourself through this crisis. And my third point is post-COVID-19 normal will be vastly different from pre-COVID-19 normal. Mm. I don't know if you understand that. Post COVID 19 normal is going to be vastly different from pre COVID 19 normal. If you've been paying attention, a lot of leading thinkers from different fields and a lot of news analysts have been saying that this pandemic has changed the world we knew forever. Newsflash the world is never going back to what we knew three or four weeks ago. I mean, just as recently as three or four weeks ago. Now, it may get better for some or for many, it might even get worse for some, but it definitely will not be the same by the time we are done with this. True. So given the significant disruptions to business and normal life that we have witnessed, it has, it's unprecedented 
telling you, forget the um, influenza outbreaks that killed 50 million and all of that. It wasn't, the world was not as globalized as it is now. And the impact, the economic impact is, is something which we hope will be soon because really from a human standpoint, there's no end in, in sight. We're only hoping for the best. Uh, once this thing is over, governments, companies, corporations, employers, they're going to start broaching because this one has affected them in ways they could never have imagined or planned. So they're going to start broaching crisis proofing governance and business strategies mm. that is going to involve eliminating inefficiencies in their operations. Mm. Because already this is already revealing that some roles, some positions are necessary. You understand? So they're going to start broaching crisis proofing governance and business strategies that will involve eliminating inefficiencies in their operations, optimizing their processes for greater productivity, even in the event of a crisis, and exploring ways to do more with less. That's what we're going to start witnessing um, once this thing is over. What that means is that many positions that you see today, many roles, will become surplus to requirements and will be retired even faster than we initially thought. And then a whole new range of skills will be in high demand. Of course, there are, there are some traditional skills that will continue to be in high demand. I, I, I saw a quote from a friend on Facebook just before I came on. I was saying, uh, um, except we start eating kilobytes tomorrow, you know, food sellers will always sell food, basically. So there, there, there are certain, you know, traditional skills and traditional businesses that will still continue to thrive. But even those businesses will be leveraging the power of digital to drive visibility for their products and services. So many positions are going to go into retirement. There will certainly be a multiplication of digital opportunities. You understand? So my question again is, are you currently thinking, that that's what you should be doing, are you currently, I mean, in the middle of this crisis, are you thinking about that future and what your role in that future is going to be? Yeah? And this is where I'm going to ask you to conduct like a skills audit. You want to do a skills on by asking these three critical questions. You know, what skills do I have to be that will be relevant you know, in the next two to three, five, ten years? What skills do I have to be that will remain relevant you know, in the next couple of years, five years, ten years? And if you've identified, once you identify them, how can I improve on them or optimize them for future productivity? So that I'm always, you know, at the top of my game. I'm always on the cutting edge. How do I improve them and optimize them for future productivity? And the third question you should be asking, what skills don't I currently have that I need to acquire to retain my relevance in the marketplace mm. five to 10 years from now? What skills don't I currently have? So this is self-leadership at its peak. I mean, you're beginning to play at higher levels now when you begin to talk of things like this. What skills don't I currently have that I need to acquire to retain my relevance in the marketplace five to 10 years from now? Because you're going to need to develop, you know, it will take a while, but as you work on it daily, you will need to develop a new drive and hunger for acquiring the skills that you need to win in this new world order. And many of them, many of them, I'm telling you, many of them, even if your business is a traditional one, like selling food, any of the skills that will help you be competitive in that space will be digital skills. And we are very quickly moving towards a world that will be severely hard. The world we are moving towards is going to be severely hard on mediocrities, mm. on procrastinators. Mm. It's going to be hard on the lazy. Mm. It's going to be hard on the financially illiterate. And it's going to be hard on the unprepared. See, a job, let me tell you something about A job can be taken away from you. In fact, you may not be sacked. Your employer may go out of business. But if you have the skills that the market needs, mm. you will not be jobless for long. You have the skills that the market needs. You are not going to be jobless for long. I like this quote by uh, Benjamin Franklin. This is one of my best all-time quotes. I quote it a lot. But if a man empties his purse into his head, empties his income into his head, no one can take it away from him. They can take your job away from you. 
you know, your business can, I mean, your employer can go out of business, but the skills you have, marketable skills that you possess cannot be taken away from you. So he says an investment in knowledge or skill pays the best dividend. I was telling someone recently that true financial freedom is not having loads of money in the bank. You can lose all of it in one investment gone bad or in a stock market crash resulting from a crisis like what we're experiencing right now. This was a news headline on March 10th, 10th of March. The world's 500 richest people, they lost a combined $239 billion in one day on the stock market due to coronavirus panic. Mm. Just in one day, $239 billion of their wealth wiped away. Now, don't cry for them yet. Okay, Don't cry for them. Do you know what that did to them? Some of them just moved a few positions down the Forbes rich list. That's all. They only moved a few positions down the Forbes rich list. They are still billionaires and they are still going to make a lot more money over the next few years than the rest of the world combined. But that's why you shouldn't cry for them. Hmm. Do you know the real losers? Do you know the real losers? Ordinary people who lost all their pensions and retirement savings. Hmm. That stock market crash. My God. <laughs> or employees without options who lost their jobs. Those are the real losers. And do you know why they lost? They didn't lose. I'm telling you, so they, they are not losers because they lost their jobs or their money. That's not why they lost. They, they lost because they have no option. They have nothing to fall back on. They probably have to live on welfare for a long time. That is why they lost, not because they lost their jobs. No people who lose their jobs, and I'm telling you, you can't tell that they lost their jobs. You know why? Because it's just a, it is a guarantee that in a week or two, I mean, employers are already trying to push them. I'm telling you. So it's not because you you lost your job or your money that you lost. It's because you lost because you can, you don't have options. You you are clueless. You don't know what to do. You have nothing to fall back on. So hello, by man. my hello. own definition, this is my hello. Uh, can, can you hello, Chris. can you go through this option where you can erase this thing this person is doing on the this okay? Thing? I don't. Who's okay? Just okay. Uh, how do I do that? Um, I think I am. I let me reclaim the host. I'll be able to. Okay. Hold on. All right. Just hold okay. on. Um, a minute. Let me so I can fix that because it's really, really distracting a lot of people. Um, let me remove that. Let, let me stop your let me stop your screen from sharing for now let me so i can just fix it automatically Okay, um, I think you can you can do that now. You can carry on. Okay. All so you, right. You can share your yeah, I'm gonna do that now. Sorry, guys, for the breaking transmission. Yeah. So um, going back to where I stopped. Um, so I was trying to tell you about my own, my personal. This is my personal definition of true financial freedom. Mm -hmm. It is having timeless. Timeless, that means enduring, regardless of whatever changes happen. Those skills are enduring. So these are timeless and profitable knowledge, skills, or expertise that ensure that you're always earning and able to multiply income. That's my definition of financial freedom. It doesn't matter if you lose your job or you lose your money. If you have profitable and timeless knowledge, skills, or expertise that ensure you're always I mean, if, if you have possession of this skill, 
expertise or knowledge, you will always be earning and multiplying income. It's inevitable. And one of those timeless skills is the capacity for continuous learning. The capacity for continuous learning, critical in this age, which means you're constantly able to update your knowledge and skills to anticipate and meet market demands. Constantly updating your knowledge and skills to anticipate. You're not waiting for things to change. You're actually anticipating and then able to meet whatever market demands. Then uh, a second timeless skill, financial literacy. Financial literacy. And I'm not talking about uh, some basic knowledge about money savings and things like that. No, I'm talking about knowing how to make money. That's one. Knowing how to keep, grow, and multiply money. That's two. Knowing how to invest money. That's three. Knowing where to invest money. That's four. And knowing when to invest money. That's five. So these are not, as you, you may know, that these are not topics that ordinarily interest the average person. No, but it's also the reason why few, why very few have financial freedom. Uh, in the world today. So my third point, um, again, is that what are you doing now to prepare yourself for post-COVID-19 normal? Very critical question. Which takes me to my fourth point. My fourth point links up one to three. So once you've done steps one to three, in other words, you've changed your perspective about adversity and you now view it as an opportunity for growth, you work on building a positive mindset, and then you begin to take steps to prepare yourself for the future by conducting a skills audit and you know, asking yourself questions that open you up to new possibilities. Once you do those three things, your mind immediately morphs, it becomes a fruitful ground for fresh ideas to blot up. Once you put, get your mind right, you, know, you put it in that state of positivity, you know, you see adversity as an opportunity for growth. You begin to work on building a positive mindset, and then you're taking steps to prepare yourself for the future. Your mind is ground for fresh ideas to blossom. Now, what you want to do in that state, write down every idea. Mm. And I mean every idea that comes to your mind. As you take the steps, ideas will come. It's inevitable. Mm. What you want to do, document your ideas write down if you see my book my idea book oh my god sometimes i'm sleeping in the room i just jump up and i run to the office and i quickly write stuff down i go back to the room sometimes i, I don't like to keep my phone beside me when i'm sleeping sometimes i carry the phone i'm forced to carry the phone so I can quickly jot down because the ideas have just been flowing so write down those ideas that's just one part the next thing you want to do is begin to take immediate steps or actions to execute on on one or two of those ideas that most interest you don't delay maximize the momentum you know of the period in which you received the idea and begin to execute on one or two of those ideas that most interest you uh, do you know why this is important it's because we are transitioning into a world where even if you're a high income earner from bid employment, it will be foolish for you to be reliant on a single income source. I, I, have, you see, I have no iota of doubt that ideas will come to you. They will. Once you've done those three things I mentioned before, they will begin to flow. The human mind is an ideas generating machine. And once you create the right conditions for the mind to function, the ideas will flow inevitably. So the question here is what will you do with those ideas? Will you continue to talk yourself out of your potential greatness by stating a thousand and one reasons why your ideas cannot materialize? Or will you take a bet on yourself for once? Take a bet on yourself, risk failure, and act on your idea. Ideas are how you take control of your life. I'm not talking about you doing things that are out of your control here, obviously. For example, you don't have control over natural disasters. You don't have control over this pandemic. You don't have control over political upheavals. Those are out of control, and it's actually a waste of energy trying to do anything about it. The bigger question is, what are you doing about the things that are actually within your control? Like, what big 
daring, bold, even fearful moves are you going to make towards the actualization of your ideas and dreams? Because for a lot of us, it is actually, you'll find that life is actually happening to us. Many of us, we've lost, I've, I've been in conversations with you know, a number of people over time, and I find that we've lost the compass of our, our lives. There's no hunger. You can't sense any hunger, any fire, any passion, any drive. We are caught up in this cyclical existence of living from paycheck to paycheck and working to pay bills. We're not truly living. You know, I see a lot of folks online right now, as we speak, just before I came on the past couple of days, complaining about the full or partial lockdown in their cities and whining that they have to sit at home, that they are going to be bored, you know, and things like that, that they're not going to see friends and go. I'm like, these guys don't get it to me. I'm like, you're complaining. You have a once in a lifetime opportunity. These kinds of things don't happen every day. You have a once in a lifetime opportunity that just presented itself to you to actually take a step back from your busy but unprofitable life because you, you're still living from picture to picture. An unprofitable life, basically. So, in spite of your busyness, you're living from picture to picture. It's an unprofitable life. So, this gives you an opportunity to step back, evaluate your life, introspect, you know, for a minute, and actually see if life has been happening to you or you've been happening to life. When this thing is over, I'm not kidding you, and you're going to witness it. I hope you will be part of it. When this thing is over, a lot of people actually are going to come out better and stronger. Because right now, as we speak, you can't tell what people are doing. A lot of people are strategizing. They are reading. They are learning new things. They are thinking through fresh ideas. They are reconnecting with some critical connections that can make things happen for them and to and they're, and they're, they're already working on outlining a detailed plan of steps they will be taking once normal business resumes to crisis proof their future so the worst thing that i'm seeing that can happen to anyone who's alive today and witnessing this pandemic is to go through this and not learn the lessons that this moment is teaching us because this moment is teaching us many lessons so if you go through it normally and then things are over and then you go back to the same old way of doing things, you've not learned your lesson. And you know why this is the worst thing that can happen to anyone? It's because history always repeats itself. And those who don't learn from history, they are bound to repeat the mistakes of the past with possibly more devastating consequences. The future, I'm telling you, will be unkind, the unprepared. The future is going to be unkind to the unprepared. You know what many of us are like? We're like this. We're like a farmer who didn't plant any seeds in planting season and then went out in harvesting season expecting to reap a bountiful harvest. That's how many of us are. Many of us have lofty dreams, wishes, aspirations, and hopes, but those things only live in our heads. They live in our heads. We are too comfortable to take uncomfortable actions that will make those hopes dreams and aspirations come to pass. One thing is certain, you cannot profit from the future you're not investing in today. By taking action, translate your ideas into tangible products, tangible products and services that will benefit the world and enrich you. So as you get your mind into peak state, as you get your mind into peak state, following some of the uh, counsel I've given today, um, Document, don't forget, that's the first part. Document every idea that comes to mind and then begin to take immediate steps or actions. Execute on one or two of those ideas that most interest you. So my fifth point, my fifth point is a very important one. Leverage social media to drive your agenda. Very important. I, I hear a lot of debates. I deal with people a lot. And I just laugh. Staying off social media is the most foolish thing anyone could be doing right now. Mm. It's the most foolish thing anyone could be doing right now. Saying you are just trying to stay off social media. Let me give you a perspective. There is no longer a dichotomy between the real world and the virtual world. For Pete's sake, the, real, the, the virtual world we are talking about is an extension of the physical world. And you see, this reality is going to only become more pronounced as technology advances and disrupts life as we know it. 
you know what's you know you know what is funny to me you know what's funny to me which is the thinking that keeps a lot of people small mm. what's funny to me companies and organizations that people work for that mm. you and i work for many people work for they are dedicating huge budgets to social media advertising and marketing <laughs> and they are strategically creating a presence for themselves online in order to drive visibility and profitability for their business then you that is working for the company. <laughs> You're saying you want to stay on social media <laughs> in the 21st century. See, <laughs> you're, what you're doing is you're sabotaging yourself. That is your gateway to the future you've always imagined. Mm. Free, it's free marketing, basically. Free marketing for your ideas, for your business, for your creativity. I, I, I'll tell you a story. Story. Very interesting story. Uh, many of us probably know who this is. This is Kylie Jenner from the Kardashians. Have you read her story? She leveraged social media to market a range of cosmetic products. Kylie Cosmetics, I think it's called. And she made $300 million in revenues in less than two years. This is one person, one person, leveraging social media to drive revenue for her products. You know how long it took major beauty conglomerate like l'oreal l'oreal that has over 86,000 employers to do do you know how long it took them to make the same amount 50 years it took l'oreal almost 50 years to make the same <laughs> amount that this lady mm-hmm. made in less than two years as a single as a single individual with just 12 employees the fact that you're still having conversations around if you should be on social media or not shows you still don't get the memo the question isn't if you should be on social media. The question is, what are you doing on social media? Yes, How are you using social media to advance your vision and your mission? That thing in your hand is power. It's your meal ticket. Trust me. Let me give you a personal exa- example. I'm a writer, as Chris said at the beginning, and I'm active on Facebook. I have a decent following on the platform. So I try to put out content every day and I get feedbacks, I get reactions, I get engagements. Now, someone I've never met before, we have never had a conversation online. He hits me up inbox. Oh boy, I, lo- I love the way you write. You know, I need you to, I, it is you I want to ghost write my book. And then, you know, we, I sent him a contract, I agreed a contract of thousands of dollars and ghost writing um, agreement in the middle of the same crisis, you know, so where people are losing money. Some people are actually gaining money, leveraging social media. Uh, okay, how did I even get this speaking engagement? As Chris, if you, if you had joined at the beginning when Chris and I were having a cheerful banter, uh, is a con- Chris is a connection on Facebook. I, I don't, I'm not even sure I have Chris's telephone number. <laughs> Chris <laughs> probably doesn't have my telephone number. <laughs> but he reads the content I post on Facebook. You know, every day he likes, he engages, he shares, and then he, he hits me up inbox and says, my community on Daba and the world, you need to hear this wisdom you put out on Facebook every day. If I wasn't expressing my passion on social media, I wouldn't have gotten this opportunity to speak to you today. And as you can see, even with this webinar, we're in different places all over the world. We can't even meet physically if we're to be in the same country, but we're in different places all over the world. Hmm. You know, but we are meeting digitally and we are able to add and gain value to and from one another. This is the future, guys. You can't be caught napping. You have to get on this ship before it leaves the door. Yeah. There's still a wealth of, that's if, if it hasn't even left, there's still a wealth, though, quite frankly, there's a wealth of unexploited digital leverage on social media. And now is the time to begin to educate yourself, you know, on how you can maximize it. The chairman of one of uh, America's biggest broadcasters, I think it's Comcast or on NBC Universal, was lamenting recently on the impact that YouTube content providers are having on mainstream uh, broadcasting companies. Because more and more people are subscribing to YouTube Premium and choosing to stream content on YouTube, you know, which gives them greater control over their content and choices. And many are abandoning cable television. And of course, advertisers are also diverting their ad spend, you know, to social media platforms. So this is a major thing. This is, this is a, I was watching uh, CNBC's Make Money, I think it's called. 
something like that um, recently. This, this is what I saw. This is what they, they were interviewing this guy, uh, Graham Stefan. He's a YouTube content creator. He speaks on uh, things like real estate and stuff because he works in real estate. Um, look at his monthly income, mostly generated via YouTube channel. This is monthly, not annual. Mostly generated via YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. He works as a real estate agent. Look at his, just look at his real estate commissions, $8,572. Mm -hmm. so you see his real estate commission, but look at how much he's making from his YouTube channels in a month, upwards of 80 something thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. 200 and something thousand dollars on YouTube. In Canada, something funny happened last year. This is Dazone. Some of you might probably know Dazone. Dazone is, is a new streaming service, just five years old. It outbid traditional heavyweights in Canada like TSN and Sportnet. Cured the broadcasting rights for major sporting competitions like the English Premier League in Canada. So you can't watch English, the English Premier League on. 40-year-old heavyweight broadcasters like TSN and Sportsnet. You have to download an app, Dazone, you know, and pay something, just something small monthly to watch, to watch um, the English Premier League in Canada. That's to show you the power of digital. Look at Disney. Disney recently launched a streaming service and it was valued at $108 billion in just two months. Mm. Now you, you you could argue you could argue that um, they already had a brand name and they had brand assets and leverage, but the value of their streaming service in just two months it reflects something. It reflects the digital potential that they had left on tap for so long. It took Netflix to wake them up to the reality, and now look, we launched it in two months. It's worth over a hundred billion dollars. So you you definitely want to be leveraging social media. Uh, to drive your agenda. Uh, so that brings me to my, my conclusion uh, this meeting. A year from today, uh, every one of us here listening should be able to answer the question I'm about to ask. I meet you a year from today, uh, and I ask you, if this thing were you know, to happen again, say in two years, it might not be uh, an influenza outbreak, it might be a bioterror attack, it might be anything, or something like this will this history always repeats itself. Something like this will happen again. Now, if it were to happen, you should, excuse me, you should be asking your, yourself these questions. What steps would I have taken to leverage my interests and my passion to create new income streams that lessen the impact of a possible job loss or, or I mean the possible loss of a job or an investment? So if this thing were to happen again, what steps would I have taken to leverage my interest and my passion to create new income streams that lessen the impact of possible loss of a job or an investment. Two, would I have saved enough to weather a future storm for at least three to six months? Would I have made enough to save enough, you know, to weather a future storm for at least three to six months? Now, would I have made new connections new associations and new partnerships that will be able to open my mind and my eyes to new possibilities. You see, the saying is true that your life today, take a stock of your life, today is a sum of the five to 10 people who are closest to you. And that your net worth is a reflection of your network. This is probably the greatest thing you can do for yourself going forward to plant yourself in the midst of people that will make you uncomfortable with mediocrity. You want to plant yourself in the midst of people that will make you uncomfortable with your mediocrity. People that will challenge you to be by their actions and their words. It's not like they are condemning you, but they are challenging you by default through their actions and their words to do more with your untapped potential. Uh, the, the author of Rillionaire, really it's a book, Rillionaire, really you can Google it, Farah Gray, that's his name, says, if your, if your associations are not pulling you up, they are pulling you down. Whatever associations you are in, they don't have to be doing anything bad, but if they're not pulling you up, they are pulling you down. Reason is, if you're constantly associating with small minds, you're inevitably going to remain small. Pretty much like the ego in this picture. See, that's an ego with the, you know, 
inbuilt capacity to fly, mm. but who keeps brooding with chickens on a countryside farm, you know, but has the inbuilt capacity to fly. If you're constantly associating with big minds, you're going to become big. It's inevitable. Your mindset, there will be a shift in your mindset and your outlook on life. If you can become guilty by association, I'm telling you, you can become great by association. You need to do a value audit. We call it a value audit of your core relationships. Obviously, I'm not talking about your family. I'm not talking about your family, but your core friendships and associates. Your friendships must be contributing to things like your happiness. That's very important because your happiness is critical to your mental health. So your, friend, your friendships must be contributing to your happiness. They must be contributing to your physical and mental well-being. And very importantly, you must have friends that are contributing one way or another to your financial prosperity. Not just friends who want to share a beer or party all the time, you know, but friends who share with you valuable information, share with you valuable resources, they share with you valuable opportunities that will take you in the direction of your dream. So do a value audit of the five, ten closest associates that you have. This is important because it's much easier to chase your dreams when you're in the circle of people or friends who are chasing theirs. Mm. It's, it's much easier if you find a tribe, you find yourself in a tribe of people who are chasing their dreams. It's much, it's much easier for you to catch the fire, to catch the passion is yours. I leave you with these um, five charges. Uncomfortable decisions. Are you going to be making uncomfortable decisions going forward to save no matter what? To save no matter how little. To cut down on things like eating. I mean, this period that shows that the things we thought we couldn't do without, we can actually do without. So, cut down on eating out. Are you going to defer your vacation abroad so you can holiday locally within your country or within your city and invest the money you would have spent on vacation on your idea? Hmm. You know, are you going to cut back on some excesses in your life where a year for two to focus on investing yourself, your time, your energy? Your resources in your dreams. Uncomfortable decisions. Are you going to take uncomfortable action? Like, are you going to read more? Are you going to learn more? Are you going to work on your dreams even when you don't feel like it? Because some people have the erroneous belief that people like Messi or Kobe Bryant when he was alive or LeBron James today are always motivated. People think they're always in the mood. <laughs> That nothing will be further from the truth. There will be times that great writers, you know, great directors, great producers are not in the mood to do the thing they love doing, but they will do it regardless. That is professionalism. Mm. So are you going to work on your dreams even when you don't feel like it? Mm. Are you going to develop viable skills that align with your areas of interest? Are you going to develop, are you going to leverage your interest Develop viable skills that align with that passion and that interest. Uncomfortable actions. Hmm. Three, uncomfortable conversation. Are you going to welcome critical feedback? If you're, if you're in a group of people that are always praising you for your brilliance, for your this, for that, you're doing yourself a great disservice. I'm telling you, you want to get in a group of people that will give you critical feedback, not destructive criticism, obviously, but constructive criticism because you learn more and you grow more from constructive criticism and you do from praise so mm. you must be ready to have uncomfortable conversations around your skills around what you're doing around your future be ready to have that you need to surround yourself with eyes who will engage you in comfortable therefore are you ready to plant yourself in uncomfortable comfortable association very key this, this is probably the most important thing we're going to do this year because once you get this right the other things will probably be it's infectious so are you going to get yourself i like a bible quote the bible quotes from the wisest man who ever lived in so long it says he who walks with the wise 
will grow wise. It's inevitable. Become better by association with people that are better than you. Inevitable. It will rub off on you. It's the same way bad communication corrupts the character. Associate with bad people, they will drag you down. Basically, the same uh, loss of your ethos behind these things. Are you going to plant yourself in uncomfortable associations, non judgmental, and inspiring people whose actions and accomplishments will make you uncomfortable with the status quo and your mediocrity? People will challenge you to think more, be more, and do more. Finally, Mm. Are you going to make uncomfortable resolution? Mm. These things are uncomfortable, I tell you. Because mm. you, you prefer to watch Netflix. Nobody, I watch Netflix. I'm not saying you shouldn't watch Netflix. I mean, Netflix and chill sometimes. But I don't spend hours anymore. I've, do, I've done it in the past. I've woken up from my slumber. I don't do that anymore. You know, binge watch a whole series for a whole day. Oh my God, what <laughs> precious waste of precious time. Are you going to make an uncomfortable resolution to choose to binge listen to podcasts and audiobooks instead of binge watching Netflix? These are uncomfortable things, but there are things you will need to get into uncomfortable action that will get you to your desired destiny. And uh, finally, I leave you with this piece of inspiration. Now, this is a slide of, of successful companies. I'm sure you probably know them. Some of them you can't, probably, you can't do without it. These guys, do you know when they were founded? They were founded in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis uh, to show you that something powerful and enduring can actually emerge from the ashes of adversity. In the wake of the one of the greatest financial depressions in the history of mankind, these guys emerged. Guys that you can't actually do without. So these guys are examples or proof points of the triumph of the human spirit in the face of crisis. Keep winning. I love you. I'm in support of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Oh, thank, I, wish, I wish there is a way we could do a round of applause. This is <laughs> mind-blowing for me. Can we just, in the comment section, type... Uh, uh, thank you, Babi Dele Salako. Thank you. I'm seeing the feed. Guys, I want to see the feedback.